recording. Hello, and welcome to Masterclass Studio Sessions. My name is Shira Gans, and I'm with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. Today's event is put on by our office and the New York chapter of the Recording Academy, and it's part of our New York Music Month initiative, which happens every June. So you can check out classes that happened in the past Wednesdays, and there'll be one more coming up the following Wednesday from now. I'll put in the chat the website for the program and you can check out all the other live and virtual events we're having this month. So without further ado, I will hand it over so you can learn about making a record. Thanks. I want to welcome our guests today, Mario J. McNulty, Angie Teo, Fernando Ladero, and Kim Rosen. Vis-a-vis -vis this Grammy Masterclass, I'm hoping that you have a better understanding of the mechanics of making a record. It's important that you know what each person who works on making your music does. As a means of introduction, my name is Joe D'Ambrosio. I am a 14-year board member of the New York chapter of the Grammys. My life's work is managing producers, engineers, mixers, musicians, arrangers, songwriters, composers, and executives in the music business. I established my company, Joe D'Ambrosio Management, 20 years ago this past April. Let's start with the architect of the mechanics of making a record, the producer. Our producer guest is Mario J. McNulty. Mario is originally from Phoenix, Arizona, and currently works out of his studio, Incognito, based in New York City. Over the course of his career, Mario has worked with David Bowie, Prince, Willow Smith, Nine Inch Nails, Laurie Anderson, the B-52s, and Angelique Kijo. He has a Grammy for Angelique Kijo's album entitled Jin Jin. One of his career highlights is mixing Willow Smith's big single, Transparent Soul, featuring Travis Barker from her latest album, Lately I Feel Everything. Transparent Soul has been streamed over 200 million times. Mario, welcome. Hi. Please Thanks describe your having me. approach to producing an album. 
my my approach really depends specifically on each artist. There isn't anything that uh, is really is really uh, the same for everybody. Everybody is personally attended to, in other words. Um, so in that way, there isn't any kind of particular sound that everybody gets. Every artist and sometimes uh, the group as well has really a customized vision for that particular album or project. What challenges have you come up against when putting together the team to produce an album? Uh, the, I'd say the most common challenges now are, I think nowadays are really timeline. <laughs> Everybody wants to, you know, take five months to 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 record a drum track or something. But um, now I think the 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 challenges are getting things done efficiently, making sure you hit deadlines, making sure the 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 artist center group understands that <clears throat> there's a certain amount of time to complete this album because you know they're. When you're making an album, it's also you're mixing sort of art with commerce. So you, there, there are things that you have to follow and, and you have to kind of keep them on track. When you're making records that you're not recording and or mixing, what's your criteria for finding the right engineer, the right mixer? When that happens, uh, usually it's it's finding somebody that's, that's uh, I mean, very very friendly to work with and somebody that can take a group and make things seamless in a studio. That's what I try to do myself when I'm recording, but um, certainly working with engineers, um, you want to make sure that the, that the band and the group feel, that the artist feels comfortable. Um, you don't, you want it to be seamless. You don't really want anything to be in the way. You don't want things to take extra time. You just want things to flow. And that, that makes it good, not only for myself, but for the artist. Everybody feels comfortable and everybody feels like they can create. Is the studio part of that equation that you're looking for comfort for the artist? It, it, it certainly can be. I mean, it, there, there's a lot of times, especially depending on the size of the ensemble and the, and the, and the people involved. I mean, it, there are times when there, let's for, for example, you have a really large group of people and um, the studio can be really critical in that. In that case, you need you need certain a certain environment for everybody to sort of have their space. It can also, in the opposite way, if let's say it's uh, one artist and let's say you're doing a vocal, you're doing something very intimate and personal. That can also be really important, where you you're, where you're in an environment that feels comfortable and safe for that one person. You know, and so it, it can kind of go both ways. But the studio can be can be really uh, you know paramount for that. Are you a big believer in pre-production and can you tell everyone what pre-production is? Uh, sure, yeah, and I am a big believer in that. And pre-production, the process of pre-production is essentially, in a nutshell, it's kind of, it's doing your homework before you go to the studio, basically. Um, I think it's essential. I mean, whenever I have the opportunity to do that, I almost always do. I mean, it, it, it's something I, I, I really try to stress. Um, even a day or two of doing things before you get to the studio and rehearsing songs, going over songs, keys, tempos, all that stuff, that that can be so beneficial. It's it's really almost amazing how much time you can save down the road. I know it, it's funny because a lot of groups think, ah, we we rehearse all the time, we practice all the time, we're fine. Uh, we don't need to go to a rehearsal room or we don't need to go to a studio to to, to work on these tracks. But the amount of time it saves you is really, it, it, down the road, is really pr pretty, pretty incredible. So I, I'm always a big believer in pre-production. Who do you look to or who have you looked toward for inspiration? People in your world, not just producers, but musicians. I know you've got a great support group around you. Yeah, that, yeah I mean, I, I feel very lucky in that regard because my, my, my biggest art, artistic inspiration was somebody I ended up working for, David Bowie. Um, but, um, that, that, and that still remains to this day, but, um, yeah, my inspiration also doesn't just come from music personally, it comes from kind of, um, art in any, in any form, visual art as well, um, literature as well. But, um, but, my, but Bowie is, is an easy name for me, but my, my, my other hero in music is, is Brian Eno too. That's a, that's a, a big one for me. Um, and I've been very lucky to work with some, some people that, um, like Prince, for example, that's a big one for me. Um, and I've been fortunate to work with Laurie Anderson, who is a, not just a musical, but an 
artistic hero for me. And um, those are people that are very inspiring. Every single time I'm listening or, or working with them, it's uh, I feel very, very privileged and lucky. All right, we're gonna switch over to Angie now and we're gonna come back to you, Mario. Our engineer guest is Angie Teo. Angie was born in Singapore and currently works at various studios in New York City. She started her career working at a right track studios in New York and currently records out of the best studios New York City has to offer, including the Power Station at Berkeley NYC, the Domena Center, Sear Sound and Reservoir Studios. Over the course of her career, Angie has worked with such prominent talents as Phil Ramon, Frank Filippetti, Julie Taymor, Lynn Manuel Miranda, Alex Lacamoire, Carter Burwell, Elliot Goldenthal, as well as artists such as Janet Jackson, Madonna, Bono and the Edge, The Neptunes, Pat Metheny, and Wynton Marsalis, an incredible array of auteurs and artists. Her career highlight, the original cast album for Be More Chill, recorded and mixed by Angie, is one of the top five stream cast albums of the past decade, over 350 million streams to date. Angie, tell us what recording an album entails. Hi, Joe. Um, well, on a really basic level, um, I'd say that recording an album is, uh, it's magic because, I mean, it, you, you, you take something that didn't previously exist and then you're putting it into a form that you can now hear over and over again, right? I mean, you can argue that, that it, music existed on a page with with lines and dots, but you can hand it to your friend and have them hold it up to their ear and have them hear what you hear. So on a, that's that, that that's what I would say. It's 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 magic. <laughs> what are some of the first steps you take when you're asked to record a project? Uh, well, hopefully I would be able to have a conversation with, with the producer, with the artist, and um, some of the questions that I would ask is what's the instrumentation? Is it mostly acoustic? Is it mostly synth based? And how different is it going to be from song to song? Um, this is the kind of uh, question that that if it is an acoustic uh, based album, it helps me to figure out the floor plan for for the session, you know, wh which musicians are going to be where who needs to be next to each other who's going to need to be in an ISO booth. And then I ask questions about um, how the, how do they want this album to sound. Is it more vintage is it going to be more modern. And that's going to determine what kind of mics uh, and gear that I would that I would choose. And then, um, lastly, just basic things like: Are there going to be any pre-recorded tracks? Is there a scratch vocal? Is there a click track? And those kind of questions help me to determine uh, how do I set up my Pro Tools sessions? Do I need, do I need to build in overdub tracks? How do I lay out my console? Uh, what do the musicians need to hear in their headphones? How vital do you see your role in all of the above? <laughs> well, very vital. You know, as the saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, if 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 everything's you know crazy distorted, or if the guitar mic gets bumped and it's facing the wrong way, or the piano mics droop and they're lying on the strings, uh, as you know, as much as technology has advanced and and there, we have all these tools to to fix it in the mix, those are the kind of things that that you you know you can't really you can't really fix. You're in a session, the producer goes out and he's not back and the band says, says to you, Angie, let's get going. Points when you have to make decisions when he or she is not in the room. What is your tact? What do you do? Uh, well, it depends. Um, usually, um, usually if, if the band wants to go and, and the producer's on a phone call or something, then I'm fine with with going because you know it'll take them a while, especially if it's at the beginning of the day and it takes everybody a while to to dial in their headphones. Um, and if people haven't played with click before, it, it usually takes a couple takes for them to get comfortable with that. So I'm I'm me and I'm you know the producers are are usually fine with with us just going ahead and getting a couple takes under our belt. Um, you know if if they have to be out of the room for that, it's fine. And they ask you to make a decision with the producer out of the room. What do you do? <laughs> I try to be as tactful as possible. And of course, it also depends on which producer we're talking about. Uh, you know, generally, if it's like a, a decision about um, should I use this snare or this snare, um, uh, I, I, I try to make the, the best decision as like, if, it's, if it's a decision that's holding up the session, 
uh, and it looks like the producer is going to be away for quite a bit, then you know I have to make a decision based on previous experience, and also hopefully make a decision where it doesn't uh, box us in. You know, if 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 we do choose the wrong snare, the producer comes comes in, comes back in, and says, you know, I hate it. Let's go with the other one. Uh, you can always go back and do another take, but at least you didn't hold the session up. Talk a little bit about Be More Chill and the amazing success it's had. When you worked on that record, did you know? No, I don't think any of us knew. Uh, you know, it it played at a theater in Jersey. Um, and, you know, I, I, I hadn't heard about the book before. It's based on a book. And I was um, called to, to work with... Uh, with Joe Iconis, who 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 was the writer, who was the songwriter for that, and I, I had knew of Joe. Um, he he was very active in in the theater scene for for a while, um, and I was excited to work with him. And you know, I did a little bit of homework. You know, like listen to his previous albums, previous releases, and um, you know, showed up on the day, and everybody was super excited and super into it. And I immediately within it was one of those things uh, um, where within the first five minutes of, of hitting record, I was like, wow, this is something special, you know, and that's only happened that that's happened a, a, a few handful of times. The other time that it happened was when I was an assistant engineer for the original cast album of In the Heights. You know, it was it was it, like it was just like, you know, you're doing something and you're you're looking at levels and you're, you're doing this and that and then like you get just get caught off guard by the music and, and and it's just like wow this is something really special and so when we it was also it was also i believe the first album that um if i remember correctly that i was able to record and mix all the way through so it was a really big deal for me and i really wanted wanted to to do a great job and and joe i and uh charlie rosen who was the the orchestrator really gave me um you know the space to like do my thing you know before 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 um before we, we reviewed mixes and i really appreciated that and had a great time working with those guys we we put it out and you know didn't think much of it and every time i would go back to um to the record label for for something they would mention oh by the way have you looked at the have you looked at the statistics for be more chill and i said no and they're like it's actually you know it's doing it's doing pretty well for something that like had no marketing and and that was playing at some theater out in new jersey and you know a year passes by and they're like did you see have you have you seen like it's continuing to climb and then two years in it 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 it, 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 it really started to take off and i, I couldn't believe it and I think um, at a certain point, it it went it went officially viral. You know, you had you had you had kids in high school and and um, and college making these uh, hand drawn animation to the songs. Uh, you had there was a lot of fan art fan art out there. There was um, a lot of people doing covers of these songs, and it just you know like the music. At the same way that it had had moved me, moved all these legions of of people, uh, to the point where you couldn't ignore the attention that this album was getting, that the 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 streams that this album was getting, and you know, some produce some theater producers came together and and they uh, were able to put it on off Broadway for uh, it was supposed to be a limited three month engagement, and within you know the first couple of weeks, uh, you know it. Ticket sales were sold out, and and unsurprisingly, it it actually did make it to Broadway. So this was the first time that um, uh, basically it was the people who got a show to Broadway, the fans who got the show to Broadway, you know, and 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 not people in the conference room or you know people in the, or like the usual gatekeepers who ushered a show to Broadway. So I I, I really love I really love the show. I really love the story of the show, and, and and I hopefully there's more like it. In the Heights, can you give me a minute on Lin Manuel? Lin Manuel, I mean, like in the Heights, I was um, an assistant engineer. And again, like I said, I was, you know, making patches and, you know, trying to get levels on stuff and come, come the first take, he, he opens his mouth and everyone's jaw just drops, <laughs> you know, and I don't think much, much has changed since then. I think the same thing still happens. You know, he's just incredibly talented as, as a, as a writer, as a performer, 
and 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 um, you know all the success that that he's had. I don't think uh, I don't think anyone's really surprised by it. It's just the rest of the world catching up. Your final question: Who do you look to for inspiration? Who have you looked to when you were starting for inspiration? Well, as as um, as when I first started at the studio as an intern, it would be the assist the senior assistant engineers. You know, because whenever I was in the back of the room watching these guys. They always seem to be like two, three steps ahead of the client. You know, it's like before people even ask for something, they have it ready to go. And 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 so I was always in awe of that. And and um, you know, back then, as I I learned, as I do still now, is that it's the assistant engineers who are actually controlling the pace of the session. So be nice to your assistant engineers. Uh, the other thing is, uh, as an engineer, uh, I have very fond memories. Of, of being in sessions with people like um, Richard King and, and Jolie Wataki, uh, people who help me understand that that it's not about you know the the fancy plugins or or the stacks and stacks of gear that it's just about getting the mic into the right place in front of a great musician, and and um, uh, you know just a lot of things that I learned also just from watching them in terms of how they interacted with producers with musicians and how they communicated. Um, you know, I still think about those days uh, often and then now it's um, it's my peers, you know, we have a great Community of engineers here in New York City and and a lot of them uh, people like Ian Kagi Isaiah Boland Lawrence Manchester Derek Lee Alex Winger I've known these guys for decades now and we've all had to navigate the, the ever changing landscape of the recording scene here in New York and it's just um, you know I'm enthralled by by how each person has their own solution to the same problem you know whenever we cross paths you know I, I, I love catching up with these guys and and hearing how um you know like the latest tips that that they have or the latest tricks that they've they found out and some of those guys are also parents and i'm a parent myself and it's a whole other challenge to <laughs> to be a parent doing what we do you know with such uh, erratic schedules and and long days so uh, you know those those are the, the the people who inspire me and i'm lucky to be able to run in the same circles as they do we're lucky to have you fernando how are you man Hey, Joe, doing good. How about yourself? See you. I'm well, thank you. Fernando was born in Caracas, Venezuela, and now works out of his studio, The Great Indoors. What a great name. Based in Clinton Hill, Brooklyn. At his studio, he does pre-production overdubs and mixing. He also records his studios throughout the city. Over the course of his career, Fernando has worked with Paul McCartney, Vampire Weekend, Lauren Hill, Adam Lambert, James Taylor, Christian McBride, and Esperanza Spaulding, to name a few. He has three Grammys, all with Esperanza Spaulding, for Best Jazz Vocal Albums, 12 Little Spells, Radio Music Society, and Songwrites Apothecary Lab. Tell us what mixing an album entails, Fernando. Well, just to take, uh, thank you for the good intro, by the way. I, I sound pretty impressive when you hear it from you someone are. else. Uh, I feel like taking after like what Angie and Mario said, like once Angie, and Mario make those decisions of what they want the album to sound like, what studio they're going to, where to place the microphones, how they're going to mic, and all, all those things. Uh, after all the editing and post-production, they would contact me or the mixer to send them all the multi-track. Uh, and I will be the last person responsible, maybe on a creative point of view, not uh, obviously there's mastering after. But I feel like this is a point where you can really shape the way an album sounds. And it can go from being something that has hundreds of tracks to just be a stereo track that you can actually listen to in your headphones out of a computer or your email or, or without needing like any specific software to like reproduce audio. Uh, it entails uh, basic things just like as levels or panning, you determine the space of where things are placed, the vibe of the song, which depending on the producer and the kind of project it is, very often if it's like a good production and a good arrangement it's there already when you get it so you just kind of like dig into polished things uh, i mean some other scenarios where people might not have like a very clear idea or they might it maybe it's a band that is self-producing you can do magic like angie saying you know and like really turn something from it, it can sound like in so many different ways like just by adjusting a few little things then yeah you can really shape the song into its final form and you speak to an artist and producer to get an idea of their vision so you can make it come true in the mix 
Yeah, absolutely. Even before I accept that project or before I get hired to do a project, there's several conversations involved with producers, artists, and labels. Uh, because at the end, all of this is subjective, right? The fact that I think something sounds amazing, someone else might think it sounds horrible. It, it's just not, I'm not always going to be the right person for every project. Uh, not, no one is going to be the right person for a project. So you always have to make sure that you're on the same page as far as what you're hearing for the songs and for the final product. Uh, and yeah, you have lots of conversations. You know, I usually talk to them about what have they been listening to lately you know what inspired them to make this album any sort of like reference like sonically i even ask for like if you were to listen to your song in a movie scene what would that movie scene be like because it just helps create all these emotions at the end that's what we're trying to do create an emotion for the people that are listening to the music to connect to right does the artist and or the producer ever come to your studio to listen or is everything sent digitally today emailed it really depends uh i i have people that like to come uh most of the time though it's just me mixing by myself at least the first pass of the song and then i will send a mix so they can take some notes and decide what kind of changes they would like to make and at that point sometimes they come to my studio or sometimes we listen live through like listen to like a plugin that you can send them so they can listen live to what i'm doing we can make the changes together Sometimes it's just like the artists or producers email and be back saying it's like, hey, we want to change these things and you just do a back and forth. Uh, but at that stage of the process, I usually like having someone either listening online or here because I just feel things move faster. Uh, and at the end, you know, like I feel that way they feel more involved in the process. And that's always a good thing. You want the artist to like feel like he's involved in all this, like it's not someone else who's making these decisions for them because uh, that way they get more attached to it and at the end like mario and angie have said this is also like a social job you know you want to be with people that you want to hang out with and they want to hang out with you and also helps on that end of things okay um as you get the files in is there a great discrepancy between a great recording or do you get things recorded so well and things recorded you're wondering did they really use an engineer to record this does it vary Oh yeah, absolutely. To great to awful. Yes, absolutely. Sometimes it's just sometimes I'm a mixing engineer and sometimes I'm a magician or a failed magician, you know, because uh, there's only so much you can do. Like there's great, like the technology has advanced so much, and there's really incredible things that we can do nowadays. But at the end of the day, you know, you can only push things so far, and it always comes down to to like their song you know if it's a bad song or a bad production there's only so much that you can do like i can try to make a song sound interesting by adding all these effects and trying to create all this stuff but i mean at that point you're becoming kind of like an additional producer and there's only so much that you can do right it's part of being a, ma a magician the band coming to you and say we really don't understand what you're doing with the mix and you know you've got it you know it sounds good how do you personally communicate that with them rather than just say, I'm going to walk away, which is really the last thing you want to do as a magician? How do you do that personally? How do you tell me the artist, I don't think I'm hearing it and you know, it sounds good. What's your tact? What's your take? Well, I think it's very tough. Like I feel like you can't, I, I just can't tell an artist, no, you're wrong. Because at the end, this is their album, you know? Hopefully they're the people who are going to be playing these songs live for the rest of their lives in front of millions of people uh, and that people are going to be listening to this song nonstop, you know. You can always make suggestions, so you can start from a point like at least I would be like, okay, so what, what is it about this that is not working about it, uh, about the song for you, you know, like, and then you can try to like explain them in a way without being condescending, just be like, okay, just to understand this is kind of like where I'm going, this is what I was thinking. And I feel like very often once you're having the conversation, you know, you can start seeing each other's perspective and you can start understanding a little bit better both sides of the argument, you know. Uh, but at the end, you know, that's part of like being a mixer. Like you're always going to have someone to tell you, no, this sucks. I want to do it this other way. And then you might feel like it's not the right thing, you know, but you have a label and a producer and an artist to make happy. Have you ever walked away? where yeah. the artist is just too thick headed and they just can't see what you're doing, even though you believe it and you're right. How do you do that? Have you done it before? I've done, I've done it only a couple of times. 
it's never been an easy decision. One of them, I just simply told the artist, like, you know, like, I understand what you're trying to do, to be completely honest, just not what I'm hearing it. And I think that means that I'm not the right person for this project. I think you should try to find someone else because uh, you don't want to burn any bridges, right? Maybe right. the next album, they want to do something different. At the end of the day, this is like a small community. You don't want someone to go to their friend who would place in this other band that you were a, a dick, you know? So, and so so you have to find ways away. And other times I, I did do a project where they were making me make some like extreme changes that I just really disagreed with. And I just had to step as like, sorry, like at the end, my name is going to be on this if we're credited, which everyone who's watching here please credit your engineers producers mastering engineers and everyone um because at the end of the day whether it's my album or not my name is on it you know someone else might hear and they say oh this sounds horrible who makes this and then i lost a few gigs because of that so if the train is going off the side of the mountain at some point you have to jump you will jump yeah absolutely okay what's your favorite type of music to mix I do a lot of pop and rock stuff. Uh, I grew up listening to that and I don't get tired of it. Uh, luckily though, my career has been very, it switches from genre to genre and that thing keeps things interesting. And it also allows me to inform myself from like, you know, cause you can always bring things from one genre into the next and make something special with it. Uh, but I love working on the pop and rock side of things. Who inspired you in coming up and you want to be a mixer? Who did you listen to um, engineer wise? Who are some of your favorite mixers, but who did who inspired you to do this and excel at what you do? Well, I think people that I look up to that when I heard some of their mixes, I it made me actually think it's like, oh, wow, who mixed this? Like it took me to that level, you know, because sometimes you just don't even think about it because it just sounds good and that's it, which is great, you know, but sometimes I hear something it's like I have no idea how they got this sound. Uh, and people like Chad Blake, he's a huge inspiration on me. I feel like also like more younger guys, Sean Everett, he also falls in that side of things. Uh, I always love Elliot Shiner, Bob Clear Mountain. Uh, when I started working in the city, I worked at Avatar Studios and Rich Costi was locked in, in a room and I just loved going up there and listening to what they were doing when I was helping recall stuff because uh, he's one of my favorites as well. Or Serban, Manny, Kevin Killen, there's so many people, but at the same time, I feel like, like Mario is saying, like when I get to my studio and I'm getting ready to mix, I actually have always like some sort of like poetry book or something that I can read super quick that will just like, it's a different sort of inspiration that is not necessarily like a sonic thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, I feel like you get inspiration from everywhere, life, you know? Okay. Thank you, man. Kim, how are you? I'm very good, Joe. How are you? Good. This is Kim Rosen. Kim was born in Northampton, Massachusetts, now works out of her studio Knack Mastering in New Jersey. Over the course of her career, Kim has mastered music for tons of people, including Bonnie Raitt, Franz Ferdinand, Dashboard Confessional, Betty Levette, Nina Freelon, Rhiannon Giddens and Francesco Turisi, Alison Russell, The Milk Carton Kids, and Joe Henry. She's won two Grammys in the Best Folk Album category, for Amy Mann's Mental Illness and Rhiannon Giddens, They're Calling Me Home. She also has two Grammy noms for Best Engineered Non-Classical Albums by the Milk Carton Kids, All the Things That I Did and All the Things That I Didn't Do, and Ryan Freeland's The Greatest Title Ever, and Ryan Freeland's Dig In Deep. Tell us, Kim, what- That's Bonnie Raitt, not Where? Ryan Freeland. Oh, Bonnie I'm... Raitt, Dig In Deep. So sorry. Um, tell Ryan us... was the engineer. Ah, okay. Research is not always perfect. Um, tell us what mastering an album entails. So we heard a lot about how to make a record. Uh, mastering a record is the final step in the creative and engineering process before it gets sent off into the world. Um, whether that be uh, as a vinyl record, uh, streamed on a streaming platform, uh, even a CD, they still make those these days. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the final stereo mix and I'm going to take all of the songs, put them in order. I'm going to make sure that the relative uh, volume of every song um, flows nicely from, you know, song to song, track to track through the album. I also make some adjustments, perhaps to the tone of things. So 
I might be able to adjust um, the bass uh, in every song, a few of the songs, um, to make it sound like an album. And now it, it really differs how much of that adjusting I might do from project to project. Um, some, some things come in and they sound just spot on, very minimal work I'm gonna do to change things sonically. And then other times there's a lot of work that needs to be done to kind of bring things to a, a common ground and get it sounding cohesive like an album. Uh, beyond that creative part of things, uh, a mastering engineer is going to prepare all the final files um, in the correct way. So there's uh, a certain way and format to make files that are going to a vinyl record. There's a certain way to make files that are going for streaming and a certain way to make a file that's going to be made into a CD. Um, and they all take a different specific set of parameters to really make it sound best on each format. I get questions from managers a lot. Well, the specific question is, Joe, why do we have to master this? It's mixed. It sounds great. And I get a little angry. And then I say, well, you answer it, Kim. Well, for precisely that final thing I was talking about, you know, to make those files um, properly, correctly to spec, um, you know, it really, you really need to know how, how to do that, you know, to take just a mix and send it off. It's not going to be optimized for streaming. Do you know what uh, sample rate it needs to be sent at? Uh, do you know how to prepare the files for vinyl? Should you make any adjustments because the vinyl format playback is a little different than streaming or CD? Um, you know, all of that knowledge and information, you know, that's what a mastering engineer is for. And then also, I mean, if you've ever heard an album not mastered and mastered, the difference can be subtle, but it's quite impactful most of the time. Um, and that's really what we're going for. We're looking for something that is going to elevate um, the sound of a project 5%, which doesn't sound like a lot. But when you listen to a before and an after, um, you know, it, it, just, it just completes the project. When I used to work for Phil Ramon, when I started in this business, when none of you were born, um, we would go to Sterling and before you were mastering and Ted at the time would be mastering a Billy Joel record and Phil would sit outside the whole day. They'd buy him lunch and we'd talk about baseball. And I'd say, Phil, how come we're not inside listening? And he said, we'll go inside at the end. Um, do people come to here anymore? Do you just send them the files? What, what's uh, going on today? So I'm actually starting to find that people are coming in more. So I'm getting a lot more att attended sessions lately, uh, which is great for me. I love having company. Um, however, uh, I'm of the mind, I really like clients to listen in an environment that they are most familiar. So if they come into my room, it sounds great, um, but they're gonna make decisions and comments about how things are sounding to direct um, the session and the, the final result of the mastering. And that's not always um, what they would have decided if they were listening in their most familiar spot. So I find that, you know, as far as being effective, um, that's not always the case, but it sure is fun to come in and, and see the gear and listen, you know, on the big fancy speakers where it sounds, you know, really fabulous in this room. So the experience is great and it's nice, nice to socialize, but um, in terms of being efficient, not not always necessarily. Um, so yeah, I do a lot of sending stuff through FTP, mm -hmm. um, sending it for people to review, sending final files. Um, you know, prior to the internet days, everything was sent snail mail. I mean, we were FedExing 15, 20 packages a day on the regular and then waiting, lots of waiting. Not anymore. Comments from people who do come or not, uh, do they range from uh, sane to insane? Um, well, I would say the most sane and the most regular would be, you know, adjustments to volume. People a lot of times want things louder, which is a very typical thing to hear. Um, it gets really tricky because people will compare a mastered WAV file to something they're listening to streaming, which has been normalized and adjusted in, in different ways that we don't, we haven't, um, that we can't control. So, you know, it's, 
it's people just one of the other comments that they might make is if I can, you know, adjust the level of a vocal or a panning of a guitar. Um, so a lot of times a little bit of inexperience leads people to believe that I can do more than I can. And there's lots of uh, secrets and things that I can do to make slight adjustments. Um, but for the most part, if a client is looking for something that's significant, we'll have to go back to the mix engineer and check in with them and see if they can make a change. Um, you know, but yeah, do you comments, have to, comments will range pretty, pretty broadly. Okay. Do you have to explain to the artist, not probably to the producer that as it leaves your place knack in the best possible sounding format, it can, when it goes to DSPs, they're going to compress it. IE, it sounds a bit different than when it leaves your room. Yes, so you know it 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 should not sound that different. Okay. Um, you know, everyone is in the same boat. Every single artist, engineer, everyone is preparing their files and their songs and their album in the best way they can, um, and then sending it off, and everybody's listening to it, and for the most part, enjoying it. You know, it's that's just. I don't think that there's anything that's so terrible that's happening once it gets out there. Okay. It's not what I've heard, but I trust you more than I trust who told me that. Um, any favorite type of music to master? I have a pretty eclectic taste in music. Um, so I love listening to a lot of different things. Um, however, because I have really great working relationships with engineers that have a tendency to stay in a certain wheelhouse. Um, I find myself kind of in that same wheelhouse. So a lot of Americana, a lot of folk, a lot of blues, um, singer songwriter stuff. Uh, but really, I cut my teeth and I came up mastering a lot of hardcore, a lot of metal. So, you know, my my range is is quite is quite broad. Um, and because of my taste in music, I really find it easy to connect to whatever genre that um that i'm presented with and and really doing it justice to the best of my ability okay who did you look for for inspiration when you were coming up so when i started my mastering career you know one of those easy things turning over an album at the time it was cds um this was pre-streaming so it was pretty easy to figure out who worked on something that you liked um a lot of the albums that i would turn over would be greg calby george marino uh ted jensen bob ludwig you know and i don't know that that made me seek out more of their work i would always just kind of keep a tally of things that i really liked and i would find the same names um over and over again um you know as you as i uh, have worked and uh come up in my career i've met a lot of just fantastic um engineers that have become good friends uh both near and far <clears throat> and i think that it's a really something that a lot of people are i think angie mentioned in this you know it's really about having a good community you know, it makes all the difference. So whether it's people that you're working with, people that you can talk about what's going on in your work life, um, your challenges, things that are going on that are kind of stressing you out, you know, it's really important. So whereas in the beginning of my career, I was looking and inspired by these other engineers, you know, I'm at a point where I'm looking around me and my peers and my good friends, <clears throat> you know, they're who inspire me now. Um, you know, also really, truly getting back to see live music. That was really, really an, an important and impactful part of this past year. You know, the, the two years um, since COVID started, it was hard for artists, touring musicians, um, but getting back to see live shows <clears throat> was just fantastic. You know, you, you, you see that show, you sit in that room with all the other fans, you feel that energy. You know, that's when I'm working. 
and I'm working on mastering something, I'm looking to bring that experience, that impact, that energy that you feel from a live show to what someone feels when they listen to a final um, master. Fanboy question. I don't see many live albums anymore. Have you done any? And if so, any unique challenges from a studio album? Um, <clears throat> I did master a live album last year for Death Cab for Cutie. It is yet to be fully released. It was released for one day for 24 hours and all the proceeds went to some benefit, which was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, but they said they're gonna release it, full release soon. <clears throat> one of the challenges of that is if there's not desirable crowd noise between live songs you kind of end up doing a lot of funny editing to get it to sound natural and right and fading out you get all the, the hoots and hollers that are going between songs you know but if it's a great band um you know it's going to sound good you a great mix and mix engineer will mix it it'll sound good but it's really kind of the transitions of a live album that can sometimes be tricky yeah but overall no and in fact for the most part you have a you know an experienced engineer um recording a live album's pretty consistent you know from song to song there's not much that's going to change like it could in a studio recording um so yeah uh your last question any particular challenges as a woman ah <clears throat> We only have a couple. Of I, I believe that my experience, um, and I know this is definitely not most female engineers' experience in the industry, has been pretty mellow. Um, some comments here and there. I was lucky enough to have a really good mentor when I started, Alan Douches. He was fantastic and encouraging. Um, and, you know, maybe a couple clients coming in when I had started mastering that would assume that my boss was mastering projects and I was just putting my name on them so that it wasn't really me and we just put my name on it so I can get you know experience um but then when I went out on my own and started my own studio you know I'm just really lucky find find really great supportive people um you know be honest be myself um, I'm, I'm just, I haven't had too many um, uncomfortable situations, but also I'm not, I'm not around people a lot. I'm kind of in my room by myself a lot. So the most that I'm going out and meeting people is for events and everybody there is always, you know, pretty great. But, you know, I know that this is definitely not the case for most people that are in working studios and people are coming and going. There's a lot more opportunity to have uh, less than favorable interactions with um, not very kind and woke people. Angie, I have to throw it to you as the other woman on the panel. We have about a minute left. Any oh, that's not fair. <laughs> I'm sorry. Any <laughs> challenges for you? Um, sure, there are challenges. You know, uh, I remember being in a studio in the control room turning the knobs, pushing the faders, and the client will walk in and say, so who's engineering today? You know, and I uh, have been in situations working in certain genres where you're sitting there while people are have lyrics that are quite demeaning to women. Uh, there have been situations where as as a I forgot what were the exact words you used, Kim, uh, less than favorable interactions, <laughs> uh, you know, more than I can count on 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 two hands, unfortunately. Um, but I think as I've gone up through the years, uh, those interactions have have gone way down. Uh, and and I think that's um, that has to do. Uh, hopefully, you know, when people get into the room and they know that I'm not just there uh, because nobody else was available, that you know that I, you know, they can like that I can actually do what I said I was going to do and produce results that that um, their their stereotypes and, and prejudices will, will uh, fade away. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. I think that's all the time we have. I really appreciate you guys jumping on. And um, thank you all so very much. It's great to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you.
All right, now we're going to move on to the questions. Um, so to start, uh, Gary Houghton asks, uh, for engineers, I'm new to recording and wondering how to keep track of each take. Do you hit save after each take of a song? How do you label each one so you can find a specific take later? Um, I'm thinking once, what, what would make you pick like the best take of a song? So, so file management is really one of the foundations and very important foundations of recording, recording, mastering, mixing, anything um, for this precise reason. So you can get back to a take that you wanted. Um, it, how you label things sometimes depends on the um, digital workstation you're using. So if you're in Logic or Pro Tools, um, you know, but basically you, you end up with sometimes long titles. And so if it's a vocal take, you know, vocal, maybe you want to include an abbreviation for the mic that you're using. And then you don't have to write take, but then yes, you, you have to number them, you know, one, two, three, four, um, and then have perhaps some notation, either you're um, writing down, keeping track of ideal takes. So you write down the number, um, or you can include that in the title of the file as you name it for um, every file that you record in which seems tedious, but you know, when you don't do these things, you can end up kind of with your head spinning, trying to figure out where that take went, what happened, which one did we want, which one is this? Um, so yeah, file management is one of those things. And once you find something that works and once you establish it, you wanna stick with it. So changing things too much can also lead to kind of more confusion. So Antonio asks, how much spontaneity is there in the arrangement, in arrangement, ugh, oh my God, in arrangement decision-making, sorry. So I, I suppose that depends on what you're recording. So an arrangement, you know, is what various instruments are playing. Um, you know, if it's an orchestra, uh, changes on the fly, I would imagine, although I'm not a recording engineer, uh, typically happen less. However, changes in arrangement when you're, just recording a band, you know? So if a guitarist wants to do another take, a change to the arrangement might be a change to his guitar solo or, um, you know, a change to the bass line as the bassist. Um, I, I would imagine that more changes would happen on the fly for smaller groups that are recording rather than larger ones. Uh, but sure, definitely possible. Uh, Henry, uh, sorry. Uh, hi, where would you, where, someone's asking, where would the best places to get certified on sound engineering are? All right, so there's a number of colleges um, that you can go to. Um, there is uh, Berkeley College of Music in Boston. There's um, NYU um, in New York City, of course. There's Full Sail in Arizona. There's Blackbird Recording Studio in Nashville, Tennessee. There's a lot of really great places um, that can really help educate you and cut your teeth in recording. They all have different things to offer. offer. There's also smaller um, colleges, but they exist. There's full on you know, um, audio engineering programs at a lot of colleges, if that's something that you're, engineer or that you're interested in. Um, it might be a two-year program. It might be a one-year program. It might be a full four-year program where you can, you know, double major and get another degree while you're studying for audio engineering. Um, but that's a great place to start, but not necessary. Um, you know, the whole idea of a uh, of learning about audio engineering at a school is kind of a newer thing because previously it was it was done. You would do some recording at home with a home tape recorder. Um, and then you would hang around a recording studio long enough, sweep the floors, uh, take out the garbage, um, and then just start assisting and learning, um, learning while you work. And that was a very traditional, typical way um, of learning. And that's how I learned. I did not go to an audio school. I got a job um, as an intern or assistant at a mastering studio. And I worked there in production, which is just kind of the file side, not the changing music using gear side um, and worked there for seven years total before going out on my own. But my training, it all happened while I was working and all of my education. So, you know, there's a couple ways you can do it. It's less typical to find a studio that's willing to take on an inexperienced engineer these days. Um, so you really just have to decide 
if you want that school education or if you want to figure stuff out on your own and you're kind of a go-getter and maybe you can teach yourself enough that you could find an opportunity at a studio. What is the most important thing to get right when mastering? Knowing when to do nothing, which, um, you know, I have a lot of great gear. Um, it can do lots of wonder, wonderful things, but it doesn't, need, it doesn't mean that I need to use all of my gear on every session. It doesn't mean that I need to turn all the knobs and use all the things. Um, so yeah, one of the things to get right is knowing when um, a recording sounds fantastic and it really needs minimal, minimal work. Um, the other more technical part of that, I would say, is uh, low end. So all the bass frequencies um, that can really, in my mind, um, make or break how something sounds. Too much low end and it just swallows up the rest of the track and you can't really focus on anything else because the low end is just so loud, which I find typical of a lot of modern releases. Um, but yeah, and also if, if there's too little low end, you know, you kind of lose the groove and the impact of um, the sound of a recording. But that's my two cents. So when you're tracking vocals in real time, how do you know it takes are good? Uh, you don't. You let the vocal keep going on until the song is over or the singer stops in the middle of singing um, and you just record every take. And then sometimes if you've done a vocal take multiple times, you'll go in and you'll comp the vocal, which means that you're going to take all of the takes. Um, so let's say there's 10 takes. You go through and you listen to each one and you find the best part of each take and you edit them together for the perfect take. Um, you know, of course, some vocalists can absolutely nail it in one take and then you find that take and you keep it. Um, but other vocalists that are really striving for, you know, perfection or very meticulous, they might end up comping um, their vocal to get that take from multiple takes. Um, what made you decide to pursue a mastering career? Um, so I was always very, very uh, interested in music, huge part of my life. Uh, a lot of dance lessons growing up. I was very much into musicals, um, performing of any kind. And I was really unsure of what I wanted to do in my college years. I did one year of community college and just kept feeling the strongest about music. And lo and behold, I had someone... Um, say their friend was looking for uh, an assistant at their mastering studio. I had no experience. I went and I met this mastering engineer, interviewed with him, and he said, yeah, I'd love to hire you. So it was kind of just an opportunity that came my way. Um, I knew nothing about engineering at all, never mind mastering. And all of the education that happened while working in that studio was fantastic. Um, the mastering engineer also uh, worked had space in his mastering studio that was for um, recording, tracking, and mixing. And he had an engineer that would come in at night and, and track. And so I took some time assisting him as well to see if maybe I was interested in recording. Uh, I decided I wasn't. Um, mastering just suited me. I mean, as a lover of music, my job is essentially to listen to music all day. Now I, I change and I do things, but it's really just listening to music all day. Uh, and I can't imagine a better job than that. So I feel very lucky that the opportunity came my way, but it, it was not a decision. And that's one of the reasons why it feels kind of magical and special. So Aaron asks, what speakers slash plugins do you use for mastering? Or what are, your, some of, what are some of your favorites you always find yourself using? All right, so my speakers are actually relatively new to me. They are Strauss Electroacoustic MF4s. Um, they're very large floor standing speakers. They sound amazing. But prior to that, I had Proac um, 140 Mark IIs, which were much smaller speakers, but also floor standing speaker. As a mastering engineer, you want a full range speaker, which means that the speaker can reproduce sounds all the way down frequencies as low as 30 or 40 hertz and all the way up to 20 hertz and higher. Um, 
Some mastering engineers work with a subwoofer. I do not. I like to have speakers that can re reproduce that bass and that low end themselves. Um, and for plugins, you know, it's really kind of amazing. It's been one of the coolest things to see. When I started my mastering career, plugins were okay. You know, there was still a very big difference between what a piece of analog gear could do and what plugins could do. But they have come so far. Um, right now, I really love Fab Filter plugins. They're they're great. Their um, EQ plugin is excellent with the new dynamic feature on it. Um, also, Fab Filters Pro L2, which is their limiter plugin. Um, those are two plugins that I use a lot. Um, and I'm still holding on to some um, older plugins. TC Electronic has a really great brick wall limiter, um, and I'm still using that as well. Um, but I use kind of a hybrid model. A lot of what I do is in the analog domain and then the final limiting and some additional EQ processing is done with plugins. Um, so I'm using plugins, but not too, too many. So this will be the finer, final question. Um, Noshir asks, what does an optimal experience look like for a master, mastering engineer when everything else is done right? What are you looking for in a project that makes you optimistic right off the bat? One of the greatest things when I get mixes and I listen to them and everything sounds balanced. So the low end sounds perfectly balanced, not too loud, not too quiet. Um, the stereo imaging is open and detailed. Um, there is not a lot of compression in the mix. So the song itself is dynamic. Um, that is really just the, the, the most optimized mix to me. Now, you know, that's great for Americana music and folk music and singer songwriter music, but that's not something that you would expect from say rock. So rock things come in, they do tend to be more compressed. So, you know, I guess what a great experience would be, it could differ from genre to genre. So getting in a great rock, rock and roll mix would be a little bit more compression, but still dynamics working within the song. And when I say dynamics, I mean like, you can feel the song like move. You can feel a little bit of space in between the instruments. Everything doesn't feel like it's all shoved up to the ceiling and pushed up there. And it's just loud and abrasive. Um, so no matter the genre, I'm always looking for some kind of dynamics within the mix. And I guess that that's would be, that would be the, the optimal thing to look for and be happy for. Wonderful. Um, well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I hope to see you uh, next week at the next master class. Um, that's that's all. Thank you thanks so much. Everyone.